Welcome, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take these opinions, form your own conclusions, and make your own financial decisions. Today is Wednesday, December 15th, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, I'm joined by fellow Blockhead trader ViperXL007, and we are going back to our crypto series this week, and we're going to start part three of the installment. It's a little tough to, to turn away from the markets because, boy, were they on fire today after uh, Chairman Powell gave his speech in the, the meeting notes, but we're not going to touch the equities market this week. We're going to jump to crypto topics. Before we jump all the way to crypto, I want to give a shout out to our Discord. Link in the description below. We stream this episode live every Wednesday night to that Discord. It's free to join. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to hear what you're trading. We'd love feedback from you on what you want to see us cover. Let's hop to this week's episode, Viper. I think you're going to take us a little bit more down the crypto journey. Indeed. <clears throat> so I would say uh, we're going to call this the meat and potatoes of what, you know, most of our uh, viewing audience is interested in. Uh, you know, like we said at the outset of this series, the whole point was we obviously feel very strongly about education and knowing what you're doing and knowing the fundamentals of the underlying of what you're doing. Obviously, that was the previous portions of this series was just walking you through the concepts of what crypto is and things like that. <clears throat> now we're getting to what are your choices? What are your investment vehicles? How can you trade crypto? All that good stuff. Um, and there's just so much here that I'm really going to pull back and we're going to try to keep that 10,000 foot view uh, <clears throat> and kind of just go over the high level like these are your options these are your choices this is how we view what is interesting uh or what is to our taste between uh myself and sprocket um and then future episodes if you're interested i would certainly love to get into the nuts and bolts the nitty-gritty of exactly what am i trading exactly how am i investing um i mean to the coin level of because yeah the equities market bounced today too but that FOMC uh, situation, the meeting and everything that happened today, it was pressing a lot of fear and FUD into the crypto market as well um, as Bitcoin was dropping. Then on top of that, the just general concerns of what's happening with the economy. Um, <clears throat> and right at the end, uh, there was a really nice uh, bounce in the uh, crypto markets as well, which maybe we're turning around. Maybe we're at a local bottom. Maybe we keep going. We'll find out. But that's not the intent of this video. That you can find all over our Discord uh, as to that kind of market analysis. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Viper, before you before you hop in there, I, I did forget to inform you we're still embarking on our Advent journey. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we've got another, uh, I don't even know how you say it, but I, I'm hopeful this time that uh, we'll be maybe not the same as everything else because this is a Pilsner, Ooh. a German Pilsner style where everything else has been Hellas. And I'm pretty sure they just put the same thing in every cool look looking can, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this, I expect this one to be cleaner. I mean, Hellas are, are clean, but a German Pilsner, I mean, that's just, that's just crisp. Survey says not bad. It is different. It is different. It's different. It's it's not a Hellas. All right. <laughs> Can confirm. Not using the same batch into all these cans. <clears throat> yeah, they must have like three different batches. Yeah. I mean, Pilsner. All right. Let's, let's check out this crypto. And dark. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so let's, let's take a look. Where are we at? So we are on part three. We're going to go over uh d exchanges c exchanges and trading and investing vehicles that are available to you um <clears throat> so jumping straight in there's two very distinct types of exchanges the dex uh and the sex or c exchange i don't know what people i mean you know dex makes sense i don't know c exchange whatever but 
uh, the, the C exchange stands for a centralized exchange. So <clears throat> this is going to be what you're most familiar with as far as an organization, a concept, a vehicle. Uh, you've probably heard Coinbase. You've probably heard Crypto.com. Some other names are MEXC, Gate.io. Uh, these are uh, basically a one-to-one -one comparison to your run-of-the-mill brokerage. Um, the, it's It's an institution. It's a centralized institution where the assets that are being traded on the platform come out of a pool that is owned by the platform and the exchange. Um, therefore you get the benefit of there's no gas fees, you know, to buy or sell within the walls of the exchange. Uh, however, there are still trading fees and that is very much a differentiator between some of these platforms and it kind of goes back to those old days of, of brokerages that we talked about before, um, where you don't really have brokerage fees anymore, but over here in crypto land, you absolutely do. And, uh, you need to pay attention, um, what those fees are between the different exchanges, uh, and factor that into your, uh, to your decision-making and your trading and investment profits and loss targets and things like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the uh, centralized exchange is is more kind of like a like a mall, you know, those old school things from the '90s, uh, where you go into one building and they had all the different shops that you could you could partake in. Yeah, 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 that's true. Because in addition to uh, their them being different from each other, differentiated on fee structures and things like that, they're also differentiated on. The num let's just keep that analogy going. They're differentiated on the number of stores that they offer. You have, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, Coinbase is basically your most basic mall um, <clears throat> where it offers the smallest. I, I say that in quotes because it is still a very large selection. Um, we can get into it later, but it, Coinbase is a great first stop uh, entry point gateway drug. Uh, but you will find the more you're in crypto, you'll go looking for a coin sand off the top of my head. Uh, actually, they think they just listed sand. <laughs> well, no, no, they didn't. They listed a different one. Sand uh, is one that's really hot right now. That's a metaverse related token. You can't find it on Coinbase. So then you got to go to somewhere else. Um, so very much mall like as far as the stores that they're offered there. Um, but for me, and obviously my bias is Coinbase as that entry point because that's where I started. I mean, I picked it because it's, you know, listed uh, on the stock exchange. They're very regulated. You know, it's just seems like a safe entry point and come tax time, they'll have all the tax documents uh, prepared for you just like a brokerage would. Uh, so it is very familiar, I guess we can call it. So what then uh, is a how do what is a decentralized exchange? So what is a DEX? Um, so this is this is where we're going to start to layer in some topics and conversations and technicalities from previous episodes. So obviously, if you haven't watched part one or part two, hit that stop button and go check those out. Um, but nonetheless, a decentralized exchange is now an exchange with. Uh, swap services between, you know, tokens uh, powered by community sponsored liquidity. Um, so just some names to throw out there, pancake swap, quick swap, spooky swap, sushi swap. There's usually always a swap in the name Uniswap. Um, and more specifically, each of these function on top of a specific blockchain layer one blockchain. So, um, you know, Uniswap is Ethereum. So you're, you can't, buy a polygon, a Matic blockchain coin on Ethereum. And that goes back to the whole incompatible layer one, uh, blockchains. <clears throat> uh, so you like, that's why I'm listing these out because whatever blockchain you're on, if you need to utilize a DEX, you need to utilize the correct DEX. Don't worry. You can't just stumble into the wrong one. Uh, the way all this connects with a crypto wallet, the decks will tell you if you're on the right network or not. Um, and then you just realize, oops, this is a, this is the wrong network. What's the, what's the decks I need? Um, so the way these work are users yeah. offer up a pairing of coins or tokens in, into, uh, in the, and they have to match in value. So you offer up a hundred dollars of coin a, and you say, I'm going to pool this, 
uh, in a pool where coin A is paired with coin B, and then you have to offer up an equivalent amount of each of them. Uh, so in this example here, um, $100 of each coin. And this goes then into a pool, which becomes the liquidity pool for the decks. Um, and other people are doing the same thing. Other people are pairing up the same two coins that you paired up. Uh, you could create a very weird pairing if you wanted to, um, but that would not really be a great idea because the liquidity would just be you and maybe no one even uses it. Um, so, and by uses that, I mean, think of a brokerage, you know, brokerage, you don't trade stock A for stock B, like you buy or sell stock A, you get it back to US dollars and then you buy stock B. Um, <clears throat> so a, a pairing in this scenario here on a DEX is you're, you have, now we're creating this entirely ourselves as the, as the community of users. Um, and so you want to put up pairings that are useful to the community. So usually it's going to be a stable coin, uh, and the native coin of that network. So Ethereum or Polygon or AVAX on Avalanche, you would, you would, you would tie it to that. And so let's just say Avalanche, AVAX, AVAX is the, the main token, the main coin of Avalanche. Um, so somebody's going to come to the decks with Avalanche, AVAX in their hand, and they're going to want to swap that with other tokens. So that is to say you would offer up liquidity as I'm going to do a hundred dollars of AVAX and a hundred dollars of this other token that a lot of people are using right now. And because a lot of people are using it, interest rates are up or fees are up because there's a lot of transactions and that is going to funnel back to me and give me some passive income for offering up this liquidity. Yeah. So we keep, we would keep with our analogy of the mall. So your mall, that's your, your, your Kex or your CEX. I always equate the decks to more like your flea market, uh, your farmer's market where you got a bunch of people, they're all under one roof, but the stuff that they bring isn't necessarily all the same stuff. They kind of say, hey, let's put this together and this together and we'll offer this up. So uh, to me, the, the DEX is a little bit more kind of flea markety, farmer's markety. Everybody's kind of coming and providing their wares. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could see that. Maybe if you're getting fancy, maybe throw a little pawn shop in there where you're, you're trading one good for another good. Um, but definitely along those lines. The, the DEX protocol then is run by an AMM, which is an uh, automated market maker. So on an AMM, the traditional order book is replaced by liquidity pools like we just went over. Um, these pools are pre-funded on the chain for both assets of the trading pair. Liquidity is provided by other users who also earn passive income on their deposit through trading fees based on the percentage of liquidity pool that they provide. So um, that was just the official recap from the website coin market cap on what an AMM is. Um, but this is the market maker for this DEX and it's not quite market maker in the sense that we're used to. It's not pairing up. Well, now I take that back. It is doing what we're used to a market maker doing, um, because it needs to keep track of these two tokens or coins or token and coin that you're trying to swap. And what is the appropriate ratio when you're trying to swap these two what is the slippage that is allowed here um, but here on a dex you can actually specify what your slippage tolerance is um, so if something is uh, you could tighten it down to 0.5 percent slippage anything over that you're not okay with that um, but that just potentially delays servicing your swap uh, usually one percent is a generally accepted uh, slippage on on these uh, deck swaps. So what is, how do you slide into the crypto world? What is, what is the outline here of what's going on? This is my best attempt at what is a very, very complicated uh, world, uh, especially to a newcomer <laughs> with very little information. Uh, YouTube is always your friend. Research is always your friend. Also, we are your friend. So let's give it a shot. Um, <clears throat> So what you're going to do is you're going to bring fresh U.S. dollar uh, into usually straight into a centralized exchange. 
Um, and this is a process called an on-ramp. You want to bring your dollars into the world uh, <clears throat> via an on-ramp. And typically, centralized exchanges make that as easy as possible, especially Coinbase. You can link it up to your bank account, uh, and then you can transfer into Coinbase. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, uh, you could potentially just stay and trade right there on the centralized exchange just like you would in a brokerage. If you're going to do that, you're going to be very pleased at the process. You link it to your bank account. You say, hey, bring in a th bring in $100, um, and immediately you can start trading with that $100 while Coinbase waits for that payment to clear. Um, if you're trying to on-ramp your money and go to a different investment vehicle, you're going to be very sad because <laughs> you will... Uh, have to wait for that payment to clear. So you will bring in your money and then it will be a six day waiting period uh, before you can actually withdraw that to any other service, which is very unfortunate um, as some people can attest. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's uh, it's cool. If you just want to pop money in there and buy something right away, you literally can do it in about 10 seconds. As soon as you input your, your bank account information, the money's there and you're allowed to trade with it on the very next second. Uh, but it keeps track of how much value you brought in. And so if you buy a bunch of assets of some kind, swap them around, do whatever, you can't withdraw them to any other place for a set of days. And from what I understand, it's a anti-money laundering thing to try to prevent people from money laundering. But uh, in the world where there's kind of a few number of on-ramps, uh, basically through just a few number of these centralized exchanges, it can be very frustrating if you want to go do something you just learned about on our crypto series and invest in a, a DAO or, or something like that. You're going to be waiting a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And there are, I have discovered, I mean, and this is just part of the learning process and just how new we are exploring this world uh, there is a centralized exchange called CEX.io. I have had success where that is supported to on-ramp. You can on-ramp via a credit card uh, or debit card. Um, and then that can immediately, as long as you've done the know your customer KYC process, uh, then that can immediately be withdrawn and transferred out wherever you want to go. Obviously that comes with a fee then, and they, they tack on a, fairly hefty 3% fee. Um, so just depends on how bad you really want to dig your hands into whatever you're trying to go do. As I kind of mentioned before, um, specific sets of coins and tokens are in each uh, centralized exchange. And so therefore you might not be satisfied with the offering within the exchange that you initially on-ramped into. And so then you'll need to go hop around between certain exchanges um, <clears throat> once you're, once you hit that six day window of, of on ramping the U S dollars that, that doesn't apply then when you then withdraw that between centralized exchange from that point forward, once the, that money is in the crypto world, now you can circulate it around and move it and do whatever you want with it. There are no more, uh, shackles put on it, but in general, you're probably going to need to move that money down through the waterways of crypto money moving. Um, and so you're going to need to move that central exchange money probably through a DEX before you get to your final stop. So here's kind of what that looks like. So you have your US dollars in your bank, uh, you access them, you send them to whatever centralized exchange you want. Um, here we can see you could just sit here and loop on this centralized exchange all day long, trade, uh, buy, sell, buy, sell. Um, there is currently no wash sale rule, so you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, though I do believe regulation is coming to bring the wash sale rule in um, possibly next year, but I am, in addition to not a financial advisor, also not a tax advisor, um, but do <laughs> keep an eye out for that. Um, but nonetheless, you could sit here and just loop all day long on the centralized exchange, invest, walk away, whatever. You can do everything on one level here. Like I said, maybe there's a specific coin that a different exchange offers. So you want to send your money over there. Um, sending the money is something that, you know, 
now we're getting into the crypto specific weeds of this exchange where to send money, you, you have an address for every single token. So if we keep it comparing it to the stock market, you could actually send a bag of whatever stock you're holding from TD Ameritrade over to Schwab or whatever you want. Um, obviously today you can't do that as far as I know, but, but in this way, in the crypto world, you can, but in order to do that, everything you want to send has a specific address. Each asset has its own address. All that's to say it's pretty not, I don't want to say self-explanatory, but it can be stepped through on these uh, centralized exchange websites uh, as far as moving money between them. But it does, that's your first layer of complexity uh, from something you've never encountered before. And when you do that, you're going to spend some money. <laughs> yes. Most of these exchanges, well, Coinbase, we'll just say Coinbase operates on the Ethereum blockchain of sorts. They only offer Ethereum tokens. So ERC-20 is the protocol. Uh, anything you can buy in, in Coinbase is, when you want to take it out of Coinbase, it's on the Ethereum network. However, they don't want to like burden you with all of the crazy math and the market dynamics of gas fees. So you don't get exposed to the full brunt of gas fees as long as you're doing anything that's touching a centralized exchange, but you will pay for it. Like uh, USDT is a stable coin and it costs $25 to withdraw USDT out of Coinbase. When you're just dabbling your feet and you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put $100 in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you buy something in Coinbase and you're like, you know what? I want to try out some of these other things that are not in Coinbase. And you're like, I know I'll just transfer this money to a different exchange so I can get what I need. And then you're like, wow, I'm going to spend 25% of my investment just to move it somewhere else. That will be a sad day. Yes, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, and by that, I don't mean throw more money at it. Um, obviously, that, that solves a lot of things. But you can work around the, and this is why I think education is so fi so critical in this space, because there are very uh, clever ways to get around that. And they're not clever in that, like, ooh, I hope they don't find this loophole. Like, no, there are coins designed specifically for this purpose. Um, so for example, let's build on that, uh, that example there. So using this, uh, <clears throat> chart down here, what Sprocket's referring to is, uh, the very first thing he wanted to do. I told him about, um, this, this concept of lending. Uh, and also he, you know, he looked into that. He looked into liquidity pooling. This is very much up his alley, what he's looking to do kind of long-term in this space. Um, so that means, He's not interested in this loop here on the centralized exchange. He wants to go all the way to the right. Um, and, and very wisely wants to do it in a small manageable portion. Um, because especially when you're talking about traversing all of these steps, you don't want to just come in with a big bag of like, this is what I want to do and just throw it on the table because this is a very raw world. I mean, it, I don't know if it's, entirely fair to compare it to like equities and trading in thinkorswim or whatever is like the apple computer ecosystem and doing crypto is like the linux so the analogy that i'd give you is i don't even know where some of our viewers are going to fall but uh, if you were around on the internet before there was a google uh, and you wanted to find something and maybe you use like an alta vista or something like that you were pretty much going to write SQL statements in your search bar to yeah. try to maybe find something that's related to what you're looking at. So you'd be like, oh, if this and this, but not this, but all these phrases. And you do put them all in there. And it was it was like trying to land a jumbo jet. And, and then Google finally came along and said, you know, oh, you just put a term in there and we'll take care of that for you. Like... I feel this traversing here is a lot more of those really early days of the internet. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember it took me probably years to actually talk to Google in the Google search and not just say this and this. <laughs> like, it was, 
<laughs> so, but very much so. So, uh, yeah, it is very, and I mean, that's not to scare you away, but it is to make you very leery and careful. Uh, careful is the word of the day here. Um, <clears throat> so he brings in a small amount of money, wants to go all the way to the right, and then realizes that once, I mean, starting here as you leave the centralized exchange and then now over here, we'll talk about this crypto hot wallet in a second. But now when you're moving things over here, um, now you're fully exposed. You're whatever the network gas fees are, you are responsible. You you cover that. You know, you are an individual out in the world all by yourself. Um, and that's not to say you can get into debt that that's not a thing in, in crypto. Like there is no margin out here. Um, but what it does mean is you could move money into the crypto hot wallet and then you get stuck and you don't have the fees to cover your, the gas. Your car runs out of gas. Your car runs out of gas. I mean, the naming is spot on in a lot of protocol and crypto things. <laughs> um, and so that's really what you're at risk at. You're not at risk of, running into running up debt or anything like that, but it is very uncomfortable to have to send a transaction and have used your last bit of gas on that transaction. Uh, or, or worse yet being like, you know what? It wants to charge me this much gas, but this is a free world out here and I can lower the gas fees myself. There is a, there is a box there that lets you lower the gas fee. And now you're really stuck because don't touch the gas fee, accept whatever it is, only speed it up, by paying more, don't ever try to cheat the gas fee because you will be stranded and you may never, it may never dip and pick up your order. Um, and then you can cancel your order. Absolutely. But whatever gas fee you put into your order is gone. So that last little bit of gas, you just toasted it trying to cheapen out and now you're going to end up paying double or whatever, but <laughs> I digress. Okay. So the flow here is, um, this crypto hot wallet is, this is, this is, I mean, just picture the analogy. It is your wallet. And, it, and now this wallet is not just a trifold or a bifold. It's just this infinite fold where you can connect any network to most of these wallets. MetaMask is, I'm just going to use the name MetaMask. That's the one that I use. That is probably one of the most popular, but there are lots of other options out there. So MetaMask can connect to any of these blockchain networks and you can fill it with whatever tokens or coins you're trading. Um, so now when you want to move out of the centralized exchange and get into one of these more advanced uh, investing techniques, you're going to send it into your, this crypto hot wallet, which now once it touches this hot wallet, everything is completely in your control and in your domain. Uh, there is no organization looking out for your funds and there is nobody backing your funds uh, by any means. So we move it in there. Um, and if we were, so in the in the case of uh, Sprocket trying to get into some lending, you would have to go into a DEX to get a specific token that you wanted to lend, move it from your hot wallet into the DEX, and then you would go to the actual website or the service that you were trying to participate in, um, and drop those coins into there for the lending or the liquidity pooling or the DAO or whatever. Um, and at a very high level, that's kind of the flow of what's going on here. I don't think there's anything missing too much. And then obviously to get your money back, you just retrace these steps uh, for the most part and going all the way back to getting into back into your bank. A little more detail then on this idea of liquidity pooling DAO, lending, these advanced trading techniques. So they are, and, and this is going to be, like I said, high level. I would absolutely love to dig into any of these that sound interesting, but we have staking, liquidity pooling, lending, DAOs, all offer uh, passive income via uh, fees and interest rates that get paid to you for your portion of the asset pool or the treasury. Um, there's a lot of different ways to participate in this strategy. But the high level summary is that rather than investing in one project or coin, um, instead you're basically serving as a fraction of a decentralized bank in a, in a lot of these cases. Um, with the exception of DAOs, um, DAOs, decentralized automated organizations, um, do carry a high risk. Maybe that's 
with an asterisk or quotes. Um, but the reason I, I label these as very high risk right now is because they're trending They're They appear to be the next wave of innovation. So they are not bad by any means. I find them insanely fascinating. Um, but they are the next wave of innovation in the space, which means there are lots of opportunists coming out and taking advantage of this. Uh, however, you're, you're going to get lower risk the more you get into a more established project. So all of these are basically coming from Olympus Dow is the name of the very first one that did it. Um, so exposure, uh, risk exposure is, I believe, much more mitigated if you were to get involved with the Olympus Dow project or something. When people start forking that code, um, forking the code is not bad. That's a, that's a byproduct of an open source world. Um, but people can manipulate that in bad ways. But so they're trending right now because it's a new form uh, of this concept of creating a, not just a current, not just a coin, but you're actually creating a reserve currency. Um, and these are tied to projects. Uh, and so therefore the biggest risk right now is a, is a, is a phrase or a bad situation called getting rugged. You get rug pulled, uh, where basically the price gets ripped out from under you because whether it's a whale, whether it's an insider in the project, whether it's a privileged influencer who as the project was getting started was like, Hey, we need you to shill this project all over YouTube, all over Twitter. And this person they're talking to is just a big, you know, tons of followers, influencer, and then they say, hey, we're going to give you millions of this token um, for for your influence here. Um, and then basically it's attract the flies to the light and they pump the price up as they come in. And then this influencer or insider, whoever, sells, dumps, and then the, the rug comes out. And, and depending on when you bought in, because even though you're investing and you're getting a high interest rate return, you are still buying at a certain price. So there is high risk at in losing a ton of money when one of these rugs get pulled. Um, and this space is so crowded right now. Um, just in the last week, I've seen three or four new rugs uh, show up. Was Matt Damon involved in any of them? <laughs> no. Do you think he's looking for a project to influence? No, isn't he the guy that's on crypto.com commercials all the time? Oh, uh, maybe. I don't watch TV. <laughs> no, they, they, they have all kinds of celebrities always shilling crypto.com. And yeah. I'm like, what's going on here? I mean, I will say <clears throat> crypto.com is doing some very interesting things. They have their own blockchain. If nothing else, they are bringing a lot of mainstream attention to crypto, which is certainly welcome. So you're telling me that they've got their own blockchain with crypto.com and then they're bringing a lot of attention to the mainstream. We could call them Apple. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. They, they, they have an Apple like, um, swagger as an on-ramp for, uh, people. So while, while these DAOs, you know, I mean, absolutely you should see them if you're, if you're interested in this level of, um, advanced investing, uh, absolutely. You should think of them as high risk and you should approach them accordingly. Um, however, highly recommend learning about them, learning what they're doing. Uh, like I said, I'm fascinated. And for the most part, and I say this, uh, having not yet been rugged, um, it is nothing's guaranteed, but there are some pretty good red flags that you can look for uh, that, you know, basically common sense can tell you like, because when we know that we're dealing with projects that are forking off of a lead project and just copying the core code base, which is good because that can be very secure in the sense that, you know, that, that it, they're not mucking with the details of it. And I should also say that there are um, audit services out there that do, like if a project is very legit and trying to gain your trust, there are steps that they can take to gain that trust. Um, they can get audited by, um, again, I said it earlier, the crypto world is, has a knack for naming things. And there is a website called the rug doc. 
um, where the rug <laughs> doc is a very respected organization that goes and researches projects. It's not just DAOs, but projects and tries to determine and give a stamp of approval or not, uh, whether or not they think there is a rug chance. Um, so anyways, there are things you can look for to get a feel and get a sense for where a project falls on the risk, uh, risk side of things. But certainly I could do a whole episode on DAOs. Um, but what you might not find in this space, and I very specifically said might not <laughs> because we are far from experts here. I am very quite confident that in the U S you will not find options of any kind in the crypto space. Uh, I do believe some of it is a um, regulatory thing because I do believe that other markets have options. Um, but even that I'm not a hundred percent sure on because I just haven't looked into it. Futures and margin accounts. Uh, those are asterisks because honestly, I haven't explored that because honestly, those are not my bag. Um, if you've been watching the channel, you know that at least the futures is uh, over there in Sprocket's corner. And I do know that some of these centralized exchanges do offer products that they, they label as futures. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that they're true futures and we on neither of us, Sprocket nor I have really dug into what that means. Um, but from a very high level, it looks like they're bundling. Um, eh, forget it. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and margin accounts, there is a centralized exchange called Kraken, which I believe allows you to trade on margin. But again, this is why it's asterisk because I'm not interested, even in equities, I'm not interested in margin. I mean, except for the margin that I need to open an options trade or something like that, but I am not going to borrow on margin for trading anything. I mean, I'm a cash secured kind of guy. Um, but at a very high level, those are your vehicles. And if you're left feeling like there's a lot more to explore there, let us know because there's so much we could go into on each of those, as well as my personal view, my personal investment. Um, I guess I should also back up and say before we started this series, when I was kind of just getting into crypto and on the, on the show, we talked about reading some crypto charts and things like that. Um, I was like, I love, playing around in crypto because I can like practice my day trading and things like that. And I thought that was going to be my style in crypto was just working on day trading, not worrying about the wash sale rule. And then I found slippage and fees and bad price fills. And I was, you know, I would need to get like a 10% gain just to break even because of all of these factors. And so that's not me. I am, I'm approaching crypto much more from a long-term mindset, especially in this dip. Um, I am very interested in investing in this space, uh, and very interested in liquidity pools and very interested in these DAOs, obviously. So I'm very interested in anything passive on the automated side and anything investment on the actual coin side. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you, although I never uh, was excited about any sort of day trading opportunities in the crypto world. Um, the only thing that excited me just a little bit with the trading was it's 24 by seven. So I was like, Hey, I'm much too busy during the day to, to really be able to leverage day trading. But I'm like, Hey, I've got nights, I've got weekends. Um, I could just trade crypto and I won't say that I've ever really tried hard, but just watching the markets and, the volumes and the fills and I just I'm not feeling it uh it's not it's not my style uh even when I in traditional equities and stuff I'm always trading the options I'm always trading the high probability trade um I'm looking for that more stable uh investment the more not 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 always investment but the more stable option um and honestly, whenever you get into buying or selling equities just outright or buying and selling crypto, you're, it's, it's a coin flip. It's a 50-50 coin flip. Statistically, it's a coin flip. So you can be like, oh, it's got this technical pattern. It's got this. It's got this. Yeah, okay, maybe you're like 51-49, like blackjack odds or something. 
Uh, so I really like the investment style that that kind of tilts the things. It, it lowers your return. You know, I, I'm not going to hit a grand slam, but it increases your probability of profit. And I'm all about probability of profit. I want to try to tip the scales as much to that as I can. And when you get into these lending things that I've looked at, uh, the liquidity pools, staking, um, all of this like yield farming, there, in my opinion, is so what I know so far, this is the area that tips a little bit into your probability of profit. You know, maybe it's 60, 40, maybe it's 65, 35, something like that. But, but it's tipping a little bit in your favor. You're getting exposure to the market. Um, and my angle is to try to find these things that will benefit on crypto wide adoption and explosion in participation. And so a lot of the lending stuff is super uh, good for that explosion of interest because when people want to get in and start pulling lending, the available capital in the lending pools decreases and the rate at which the people that are in the pool get paid is proportional to the amount of liquidity available. So the less liquidity that's in that pool, the higher those rates go. Uh, to draw more people into the pool, and then the rates kind of come down a little bit. So when you get in these pools that don't have a lot of uh, available equity at the time, you're going to get good rates. Yeah, yeah, I would, and that's the, that's my angle. Yeah, and I would. There's a there's a very. I still think it's a very cool um, situation. We'll call it that. That kind of got me going into these liquidity pools, um, and is what what I believe sparked on the radar for Sprocket to come in is there's just a, there's a very unique situation on one of the platforms called Ave specifically around one of the coins called ample. Um, and again, we could do a whole episode on, on that whole situation, but basically it's, it's a very, again, I don't want to use the word safe because nothing is safe, but it's a very in your favor. The odds are in your favor, or at least probability is, worth looking at, um, to get that very luxurious rate of return. And as we dug into it, the reason why the return was there was adding up, you know, it wasn't like, like Dow's when a Dow starts, the rates are just obscene. Uh, you know, a five day APR of, of 200%. That is something that I've participated in. Uh, and gotten and gotten out, but but those rates are are so high because in the early days of a Dow, you need to have people staking and holding something steady while you try to build it up. Um, but in this case, in the in the Ave situation, like it was it was just an aha moment for me of of just the the power of this idea of lending and you know, when there's not an institution doing this, uh, you know, when it's, when it's distributed and decentralized to the people. Yeah. One interesting thing about the, the lending pools and one of the reasons I think they're, they're so popular or they do have popularity today, uh, margin is actually very hard to come by. I know Viper had a slide up there that basically said, look, I don't even know if you can do margin, uh, in the crypto world. And it's, it's not very prevalent, at least in the U S uh, but what this uh, lending pool kind of lets you do is is create margin, create leverage, um, because what you can do is you can stake your coins and you can borrow other coins, right? And you're like, well, why the heck would I ever like borrow the same amount that I staked or collateralized? Well, that's because you can take out, you know, eighty percent of. So let's say I put a hundred bucks in, and the the platform will let you take out eighty in a loan. Well, you can take out that eighty. And then you can turn around and spit it right back in. And now you've got 180 in there. Well, now you just put in 80 more dollars. And so you're allowed to take out 80% of that. And so now maybe you withdraw another 60 and you can dump another 60 right back in. And basically what you're doing there is you're creating leverage. Uh, you took your original $100 and you kind of feedback loop that through the platform to basically amplify the amount of money that you have staked in the pool. And anytime you get leverage like that, it's going to dramatically improve your returns. But spoiler alert, if that starts to fall, it's going to amplify on the downside. 
as well. So you got to be careful with that. But I, I think because there's not a lot of opportunities for people to get leverage in crypto, uh, these lending platforms allow you to actually lever that crypto product that you want to trade in. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what makes it so interesting and appealing to me because whatever the mechanics on the buyer side are, I'm very intrigued to know what they are. And then I'm probably going to look at them and go, that's too either too complicated or too involved for me, but Hey, you want to borrow mine and you know, I'll get an interest rate from you. You can borrow it. You can go do whatever you want. And I'm plenty happy just milking that interest off of you. Um, and it's kind of a win-win. And because we're in a smart contract driven, we'll tie one more little bit into previous episodes because it's smart contract driven. Um, you know, again, nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is 0%, but this is a contract as far as the lending goes. Like, first of all, I'm not direct lending to one person. I'm lending to the pool, which is a very important point of risk mitigation because whoever borrows from the pool, uh, you know, I'm not lending directly. Um, but because this is smart contract driven, this is a contract of computer code that we've already agreed upon from the outset that says, I'm going to give you this. You're going to offer this as collateral. If you don't do this, you will default and we will take your collateral. And it's, there's no getting out of it because it, you know, you can't work around that without hacking the blockchain, uh, which has yet to be done in any blockchain since Bitcoin started. So I, I like my odds. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's uh very different. Uh, I know in the past we've, we've talked about the old lending service that I participated in, uh, that was a peer-to-peer -peer lending service, and you would pool your money uh, to lend to an individual. But yeah, with the smart contracts and stuff, there's no lawyers to get involved. There's no lawsuits to raise. It's just, yep, you lost your collateral so bad, so sad. Uh, good luck in life. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. A little bit more about crypto, concluding our part three of the series. Really looking forward to a little bit more in crypto. In fact, you know, We've sparked my curiosity enough. I've got 100 whole U.S. dollars uh, <laughs> put into the crypto world these days. Um, now, I lost a lot of that to fees as trying to move it around, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll make it back. Uh, I've got some grand plans to, to slowly ramp up that investment as I become a little bit more comfortable with the options and stuff like that. So, you know, stay tuned to us. Uh, follow our journey. Uh, if you are going on a journey on your own, there's something you want to hear about that we've never covered or you'd be interested in covering. Seriously, leave a comment below, hop in our discord, message us, just get it to us. We love making viewer requested content. We will do it. Um, you know, aside from that, get back out there in the equity world. Don't get lost in the crypto solely. Diversify yourself. Uh, the markets are shaping up to be a pretty good uh, finish to the rest of the year. Uh, I'm excited to still be in them. I got some plays going. Looking forward to all of that. So good luck out there. Have fun. And remember, think outside the block. <laughs>